Um, and, uh, and on this note, um, I would like now to introduce the second speaker of this uh, today, um, Claire Healy. She is uh, a research officer here uh, in uh, the ICMPD anti-trafficking program. And uh, she is also the author of uh, Targeting Vulnerability, the Impact of the Syrian War and Refugee Situation on Trafficking in Person which is a study, a study uh, that covers Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. Um, uh, this study that uh, you can see here, and you can also download on our, on our website, um, is uh, the outcome of um, an ICMPD research project that was actually coordinated by, by Claire herself. And we are very proud to have published this study because this study is the first of this kind, which examines the, the patterns and the characteristics of internal and cross-border displacements in the war, since the war uh, broke out, um, and also focuses on the reception arrangements in the hosting country. Um, Claire has been working with us in ICMPD since 2011 and have coordinated a number of research uh, projects as well as also co-authored uh, migration studies, reports, books, and um, academic articles on various migration and uh, um, trafficking uh, issues. Um, Claire was also a postdoctoral fellow at the Lisbon University Institute and acted as an advisor at the Portuguese government, um, High Commissioner for Immigration. In 2016, she was awarded a PhD in Migration History by the National University of Ireland, Galway, and Ireland is also her, her hymen. <laughs> so, Claire, it's with great pleasure that uh, I, I give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa, uh, and thank you very much to all participants for, for taking the time to join us today. Um, so I'd like to take this time now to, to briefly first outline the methodology of our research uh, and then to share with you the main findings, followed by the recommendations that we developed based on these findings. Um, but first of all, and I think um, the, the Special Rapporteur's introduction really uh, gave us an overview of, of the kind of situations we're dealing with. Um, at, at a more detailed level, uh, I would like to, to share with you now, just first, some very concrete examples of the kind of cases that we came across during our, our research. Uh, the first case is a case that took place, uh, was reported to us, it took place in Syria itself. Uh, and one of our interviews was with uh, a Syrian activist who had been detained in a woman's prison in Syria in, in 2012. And so uh, she told our, our researcher, uh, Syrian prison guards were observed in the prison sexually exploiting migrant women who were former domestic workers. There were three rooms full of foreign domestic workers, mostly from Ethiopia, Sudan, Malaysia and Thailand. They thought they were going to the Gulf countries, but they were trafficked to Syria and they didn't have their passports. In prison, they became prostitutes to be able to buy food. The high-ranking police officers were the pimps bringing the customers. So here you have uh, migrants from outside the region who were uh, in, in Syria when the war broke out, and then based on that vulnerability uh, were, were exploited within uh, a prison. So the, the, the next case uh, was reported to us from Lebanon where uh, men from the Gulf Cooperation Council states, so the, the states in the, in the Arabian Gulf, uh, traveled to the Akar region in Lebanon to marry a Syrian girl through an irregular marriage. So the, the special rapporteur already mentioned these kind of cases um, of, of temporary or tourist marriage, muta or, or mishar in, in Arabic. Um, and divorce takes place some weeks or months after the marriage. Obtaining the, the divorce is easy as the marriage is not legalized. So here we have uh, a clear case of, of what we termed in the study trafficking uh, for sexual exploitation by means of forced marriage. So it, it's using this temporary form of marriage in order to, to sexually exploit girls. The next case then that, uh, that I wanted to share with you 
is from the years 2013 to 2014, where it was reported that some Syrian refugee children were involved in smuggling of goods and people and selling items at the side of the main road uh, in Zatari camp in Jordan. So Zatari, as many of you probably know, is uh, you know, one of the biggest refugee camps in the world. You can see an aerial view of it here. In this case, however, um, there, there really was a response to Jordanian authorities uh, together with UNICEF and UNHCR and other organizations then addressed this problem um, and, and tried to, to reach a solution to protect these children who, who were being exploited in uh, labor exploitation and uh, in, in criminal activity. So it's a good example of, of identification of the issue and uh, a response. The final case that I wanted to share with you that was reported to us from our research in, in Iraq uh, involved a 14-year-old Iraqi Yazidi girl who was sold several times among members of, of Daesh, of, of ISIS, for the purposes of sexual exploitation and abuse uh, after being taken from her family in the Sinjar region in, in northern Iraq. Then after three months of severe abuse and exploitation, she escaped during the coalition bombing of Daesh in Raqqa in Syria and managed to contact surviving members of her family in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, so this is just one uh, example of, we know that there uh, are many, many cases like this that also have been to a certain extent re reported in the media. So just to, to give you a little bit more information about our project, the title of the project was the assessment of the impact of the Syrian war and refugee crisis on trafficking in persons. Uh, the project has been running since October 2014. It'll actually end now at the end of this month. Um, the countries that we decided to, to study were uh, Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan and Iraq. This was based on the magnitude of displacement. So in order to understand the effects of, of the war and displacement, we wanted to look at those five countries that really have the most displaced Syrian people. The project was funded by the US Department of State, Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, and uh, we implemented it in ICMPD. It was a very uh, international team um, with uh, our, our entire project team based in Vienna, in Skopje and Macedonia, in Istanbul, Southeast Turkey, Beirut and Amman. Um, briefly then, just uh, to give you an idea, uh, and of course in the questions and answers I can give you more information about this, but to, to give you an idea about our methodological approach. Uh, we use an interdisciplinary methodology uh, using various different research tools in order to uh, obtain the information that we needed for our analysis. We combined both desk research and field research. Um, so the desk research was conducted at a, a regional level and at, at a national level. And then in each of the five countries under study, we had country researchers conducting field research, uh, speaking to research informants, and uh, then conducting enough interviews until we had reached the point of theoretical saturation, which basically means that we weren't obtaining any new information and we felt that we'd obtained as much information as we could. It's very important to note uh, in relation to our methodology that we did not directly interview refugees and, and other vulnerable groups, trafficked people uh, and, and internally displaced people themselves. This was for two reasons. One, we have a very large displaced population, a very large vulnerable population. It's extremely difficult under those circumstances to really interview a, a representative sample of people. And um, the other issue was this is an urgent situation and we wanted the research to be complete and published, uh, you know, and, and the, the, the findings disseminated and, and the recommendations implemented as quickly as possible while still doing valid research. So um, we didn't think that there was time to really do those kind of interviews in an ethical fashion. And so we preferred to conduct interviews with people who were at one remove from, from these populations, who work with these populations on a daily basis and have access to the information. So then uh, our analysis was based both on qualitative and quantitative sources. There are very few quantitative sources available, so trafficking data or whatever, but um, we also analyzed them. And then we triangulated these different sources. So no one source was considered authoritative. We compared different sources in order to conduct our analysis. Um, the chronological scope of the research, uh, we wanted to be able to understand the effects of the conflict and displacement. So we have, first of all, a baseline period, which is the decade before the war broke out in Syria. 
um, the, the, the baseline date for our study is, is the moment when the war broke out, but we wanted to understand the situation in the previous decade. So, so we covered that decade and that then we compared to what we referred to as the impact period. So the years uh, from when the war broke out until we published the study in, in December of last year. We looked at sources on migration, forced migration, internal displacement, trafficking, any other uh, relevant data and information that we thought would be useful uh, for the purposes of, of our research. Um, one thing to note is that, of course, when, when it comes to the, the baseline periods, uh, we really only had access to secondary sources to desk research, um, while for the impact period we were able to conduct interviews and find more primary sources. Um, nevertheless, we considered it important to cover the, the baseline period so that we don't, you know, maintain that that uh, all of the, the trafficking situations and the vulnerabilities that we found suddenly emerged out of nowhere when, when the war broke out, but in fact some of them were um, there in existence before the outbreak of the war as well. So this is really in order to determine the actual effects of, of the conflict and the displacements. So briefly then, just to outline for you uh, what, what our analysis uh, showed for, for the baseline period. In terms of origin countries here, uh, we're looking at countries in South and Southeast Asia, principally in East Africa. These are uh, trafficking victims who were identified in our five countries under study during the baseline period. Um, they were largely from outside the region, uh, the, the people who were identified. The countries involved mostly India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Philippines, Indonesia, Ethiopia and Somalia. In the case of Turkey, then the routes are slightly different. Many of the traffic people identified during that period in Turkey were from, from Eastern Europe, from CIS countries. And people were also trafficked from uh, North African countries, particularly Egypt to Lebanon and Turkey. Um, because of course of the, the conflict and the situation in Iraq during that period, um, there were also cases of internal trafficking of Iraqis within Iraq uh, and trafficking of Iraqi refugees in, in the other countries under study. Um, for Lebanon as well, there were some identifications of uh, people who had been internally trafficked. And then to a much, much lesser extent, you had isolated cases of Syrians identified as trafficked in the countries under study during that period. The forms of trafficking then that, that were in evidence um, during this, this baseline period were particularly, and again, these are uh, registered you know, trafficking victims who were actually identified, not necessarily everybody who was trafficked during that period, but uh, most cases identified involved sexual exploitation, uh, labor exploitation and labor exploitation through begging, uh, also trafficking for domestic servitude, so there was a high level of identification, and to a slightly lesser extent, forced marriage and exploitation in armed conflict. There were then also isolated cases um, of trafficking for illegal adoption and removal of organs. So this is just to show that uh, some of the forms of trafficking that we see now uh, in Syria since the, the beginning of the conflict uh, were also in evidence before the outbreak of the war. It's just that their incidence has increased. On the other hand, as we'll see, there are some new forms of trafficking that have emerged as a result of the conflict. So moving then to, to our impact period and looking at the situation at the end of last year, um, within Syria, uh, the, the level of displacement is quite high. It's over one third of the Syrian population. The current estimate is 6.6 is .6 million, but particularly in the case of internally displaced people within Syria, these figures will really always remain an estimate. The situation is very dynamic. It changes on a daily basis. Um, you know, aid agencies, it's, it's the, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and UNHCR who are involved in service provision to these populations, but not all internally displaced people uh, have access. And so these will always be estimates. But um, as of the, the period when, when we published the study and, and now the estimate is 6.6 is .6 million just internally displaced within Syria, and you can see the different governorates in which they are displaced here uh, on the map. What's really important to note for the context in Syria as well uh, is the difficulties, one, the difficulties of moving around within Syria, and secondly, the fact that people are subject to multiple displacements 
most Syrians who are displaced have moved more than once. And each time, of course, they're becoming more vulnerable. So, for example, a, a research informant for our research in Turkey told us about a group of Syrians who had just arrived in Turkey from the Aleppo governors. They said, we moved from Aleppo to Idlib, then to Homs, then to Komishli. We fled from the PYD, so the Kurdish forces, Daesh, the Free Syrian Army, the Assad regime. We had no strength to run any longer, no bread, nothing. So this is a situation where people are becoming very vulnerable even before they leave Syria, if they, if they also intend to leave. And also to move around within Syria uh, is very difficult, it's very dangerous. So this is an internal movement, it's, it's, uh, it's not migrant smuggling, but because it's dangerous, people still need facilitators. And so throughout the research, we referred to these people as facilitators of, of internal movement because they're not smuggling people across borders, but uh, they can, in certain cases, also uh, exploit people who are trying to move or, or traffic them based on this vulnerable situation. Um, in, in relation to migrant smuggling, it's, it's really important to note that during our impact period, 2011-2015, for the vast majority of that time, the neighboring countries, the, the hosting countries, kept their borders open for Syrians fleeing. So the majority of border crossings were regular. So again, there was no need for, for migrant smuggling in this case. It was a regular crossing. At certain times and for certain reasons, there were also uh, irregular crossings, but the majority of, of the crossings were regular. So when Syrians then cross the border. Um, we look at uh, the, the international displacement or cross-border displacement during the impact period. As I mentioned before, we chose our countries under study on the basis of the magnitude of displacement. The figures for the end of last year show that Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan and Iraq hosted 86.7% of, of Syria's refugees abroad. This was followed then by various European countries, by Egypt and by other countries in North Africa. The situation has changed slightly since then with more Syrian people arriving in European countries. However, because the, the, uh, the numbers have increased so much, so dramatically in Turkey, uh, as, as we'll see in the next slide, um, the proportion hasn't changed dramatically. So Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan and Iraq, the four hosting countries that we studied, are still hosting around 85% of all Syria's refugees abroad. So looking at our countries under study, this, uh, these figures refer to October of 2015 when we were finalizing the study. At that point, there were 1.9 million registered Syrian refugees in Turkey. By now, the latest figures show 2.74 million uh, registered Syrian refugees in Turkey, so a very dramatic increase. Uh, in Iraq, the numbers have decreased slightly from 250,000 uh, at the end of last year to uh, now a little less than that, 245,000, of course, because of the, uh, the, the security situation in northern Iraq, where most Syrians had, had taken refuge. Um, in Jordan, the numbers have increased slightly from 630,000 to now uh, about uh, 645,000. Lebanon is a very specific case because uh, the, the registered numbers right now stand at just under 1.1 million. Um, but the Lebanese government instructed the UNHCR to stop registering any new arrivals of Syrians uh, in May of last year. So this means that uh, this particularly applies for Lebanon, but also to a certain extent to the other countries, that a number of Syrians in those countries are not registered. So they're not covered by these figures. Therefore, the true number uh, of, of Syrian refugees hosted in these countries is actually even higher than, than these numbers. So to look then at, uh, at, at the actual effects of, of the conflict and displacement and trafficking, in order to understand the situation, uh, we wanted to, to view it from the perspective of the vulnerabilities of people affected by the conflict and by the displacement. So we first of all examined factors uh, that, that cause people to be vulnerable to trafficking um, or cause people to be vulnerable in general to, to various human rights violations. So the, the general humanitarian situation, of course, is critical. Uh, as we all know, many people don't have access to basic means of survival. This is particularly acute within Syria, but uh, is also the case for certain groups in, in the hosting countries. 
There are issues related to legal status, uh, also a lack of migration alternatives, as the Special Rapporteur mentioned, um, for those who want to move outside the region. Uh, it's extremely difficult and dangerous. For children, uh, there are various issues in relation to child protection, particularly the incidence of child labour and, and early marriage in this context. For women and girls, uh, there are also vulnerabilities related to discrimination and sexual and gender-based violence. Um, in Syria, of course, because of the lack of rule of law, because of the lack of a, of a state at the moment, there are severe gaps in any kind of an, an anti-trafficking response or any kind of access to justice. But this is also an issue to a certain extent in the hosting countries. Um, and there is also an impact of this high level of displacement on hosting communities themselves um, where in, in the regions where a lot of Syrians have, have settled. So these general vulnerabilities that relate to, to the overall situation, it, in some cases causes specific, uh, they cause specific vulnerabilities to trafficking in persons. So the humanitarian situation, for example, leads to impoverishment, uh, a lack of uh, of a, a regular legal status can mean it's impossible to have uh, access to income generation. Um, sexual and gender-based violence or discrimination means uh, people can become involved in survival sex or other kinds of in-kind transactions, corrupt transactions. Um, because of a lack of access to justice, people can accept uh, or be stuck with poor working conditions uh, and so on. So. What we tried to do then was not to uh, assume that all of these vulnerabilities actually cause trafficking cases, but rather to set out uh, the general and the specific vulnerabilities and then to, to look for indications uh, that trafficking might be taking place, various forms of trafficking. Of course, it's only law enforcement in each of these countries that can uh, definitively determine that, that a case of trafficking have taken place. But the information that we connected and an analysed was indications and indicators of where uh, this really, uh, there's a case that should be further investigated by law enforcement, by protection services, because there are very uh, convincing indications that trafficking might be taking place. Uh, one specific vulnerability that I wanted to come back to, because uh, it, it really is a, a key finding of our research, it's extremely important, um, is related to the both the legal status of displaced people and uh, their legal authorization to work. So uh, in, the, in the countries under study, uh, none of these countries apply uh, a UN refugee convention, refugee status to uh, Syrians fleeing the war. Iraq, Lebanon and Jordan have not uh, ratified the, the Refugee Convention and Protocol and Turkey has ratified the Convention and Protocol but doesn't apply uh, refugee status to people from outside of Europe. So this means that in all those countries uh, Syrians fleeing the war have a more temporary status. Uh, throughout the period that we studied up until the end of 2015 adults were generally not allowed to work and um, which left them with, with no access to, to income generation in very vulnerable situations. What's very welcome is that uh, since January, Syrians in Turkey have been uh, entitled to apply for a work permit. The Turkish government issued uh, a work permit regulation for those under temporary protection in January of this year, which is a really welcome development. Uh, in Jordan, there are also measures where uh, it, it's being considered how uh, Syrians might have access also to the labor market there. This is an extremely welcome development for us. This is one of our key findings um, that a lack of, of uh, authorization to work regularly was, was leading to vulnerability to exploitation and trafficking, both for adults and for children whose parents were, were not working. Uh, not having a legal status also affects access to, to services. So there is access to, to temporary forms of, of international protection in these countries, but sometimes it's difficult to obtain that if you don't have an, an entry stamp for crossing the border, if you don't have proper ID documents from Syria, and sometimes it can be difficult or expensive to renew that status. So people at a certain point uh, become irregular. This might also affect internal movement in certain countries where uh, people, Syrians who don't have a regular status, um, are restricted from moving around within that country. Uh, it can also be difficult to then move and, and, and seek refuge elsewhere. I know of, of one case of somebody who, who received a humanitarian visa outside of the region but wasn't allowed to leave Lebanon because his status was, was irregular. 
Uh, also, when a status is irregular, people are less likely to report abuses. Um, and all of this leads to general vulnerabilities and specific vulnerabilities to trafficking. So moving on to the actual cases where, uh, that, that we found, we found indications of uh, an increase in the incidence of uh, certain forms of trafficking. So as I mentioned in relation to the baseline period, many of these forms of trafficking were in evidence already before uh, the conflict began, but there has been an increase or there are indications that there has been an increase in the incidence. This applies to trafficking for forced marriage, trafficking for sexual exploitation, these cases that I mentioned of sexual exploitation by means of force or temporary marriage. Uh, it also applies to tra child trafficking for labor exploitation and child trafficking for exploitation through begging. What's also interesting to note is that sometimes it's not an increase in incidence. In, in the case of uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation in some contexts, for example, where before uh, the, the, the girls and young women who were exploited in prostitution were from Ukraine or Russia, in Lebanon or Jordan, for example. Now, uh, the, the sexual exploitation is taking place in the same context, but the victims are now more likely to be Syrian. Then there are specific forms of trafficking that have emerged as a result of the war. Uh, these are particularly in evidence inside Syria. Um, this is the case for, as, as the Special Rapporteur also mentioned, sexual slavery, forced marriage and exploitation in armed conflicts perpetrated by Daesh or ISIS. Uh, it's also the case for trafficking for forced marriage and armed conflict perpetrated by other parties in the Syrian wars. There is also evidence of uh, other groups, including militias allied to the, to the regime, Islamist groups, rebel groups, uh, who have perpetrated forced marriage and exploitation in armed conflict. Um, it also applies to exploitation in, in terrorist activities. I think this is an area where we're just beginning to, to collect data and start to understand this as a possible form of trafficking. And finally, within Syria, and, and it's debatable where these, whether these are, are really forms of trafficking or more related to, to war crimes, but uh, kidnapping for ransom and military forced labor is also in evidence. One of the principal conclusions of our research, and it's important to be very specific about this and to really clarify what we mean, is that a lot of the trafficking that is taking place is at a very low level. Uh, it doesn't fit with the normal classic organized crime paradigm. So we often think of, of trafficking in persons as uh, a transnational crime, a crime committed by a transnational organized group or a network of hardened criminals. What we found, uh, not in all cases, but in many cases in this research, was that it was taking place at a much lower level. These were cases where, according to international law and according to national law in the countries under study, they could be seen as, as trafficking. But um, they were perpetrated by mothers and fathers exploiting their children in, in lab labor exploitation or, or forced marriage, uh, uncles and aunts, neighbors, landlords, really not uh, transnational organized criminal networks. Um, in some cases, it has to then be acknowledged that the exploiters themselves were in a situation of desperation with no viable alternatives for survival. This is particularly the case for forced marriage, sexual exploitation by means of forced marriage, child labor exploitation in agriculture, and child exploitation in begging. So while, of course, this is a, a severe violation of human and our child rights in the case of the victims, um, we do feel that we have to be a bit more careful in the response uh, in relation to the perpetrators who, in some cases, really are in a very difficult situation themselves. What we also found is that uh, much of the trafficking taking place is not across borders. As I mentioned, there's very little uh, migrant smuggling taking place within the region. There, that does, uh, is an issue once people want to leave the region and move onwards towards Europe. Um, but much of the trafficking taking place is, is internal trafficking, so, so not necessarily related to the migratory movement itself, but rather uh, trafficking targets vulnerabilities that are caused by the displacement. So once people have been displaced multiple times or in a situation of desperation, that's when the trafficking process begins. And although they might be outside their country of origin, so for example, a Syrian in Jordan, um, they are trafficked within Jordan rather than across a border. Um, that's the kind of, that, that's many of the cases that we're, we're seeing as a result of the research. 
uh, if you were to analyze only the official statistics and the official data, uh, you would be under the assumption that, uh, first of all, there is not so much trafficking taking place, and secondly, that very few of the victims are Syrians. Uh, this has changed slightly in the, in the past year or so, where uh, in the countries, the hosting countries under study, Syrians are starting to be identified as victims of trafficking, but still at a relatively low level. Uh, however, once we did our qualitative research and we did our, our, our field research, we found indications of a much higher level, a, a much higher incidence of trafficking of Syrians, unfortunately. Um, this is due to a low identification of particular forms of trafficking. So trafficking for exploitation and begging, for example, or forced marriage is not often identified as a trafficking case. It's also, in some cases, uh, among stakeholders due to a lack of knowledge on, on trafficking and a capacity to identify and respond to trafficking cases. Uh, in many cases also, victims would be afraid to report. So uh, Syrians commonly would be afraid to report a crime to the authorities in, in the hosting country because if their status is irregular, they would fear arrest, detention or deportation. Uh, in cases of, of trafficking for sexual exploitation, there might be a stigma attached uh, to being a victim of that crime, or simply because uh, they, they, they might be uh, in a situation of labor exploitation, but uh, they have no alternative uh, in terms of income generation other than to, to earn a very, very low salary, and so they don't actually leave the, the situation of exploitation. Uh, we found a number of child protection issues that leave children more vulnerable to, to trafficking and also lead to actual child trafficking cases. Many children within Syria, but also in hosting countries, are out of school. Uh, children born to Syrian parents since the outbreak of the conflict, uh, it's very difficult for them to have birth registration. Uh, this causes them to be more vulnerable, have a lack of access to, to basic child rights and possible uh, causes possible statelessness also in the future. In addition, a lack of legal status for adults. So when adults don't have access to services or to income generation, this also impacts children's access to education. And then in, in the context of this particular conflict and displacement, there is a relatively lower level of unaccompanied and separated children. There's a, a you know, humanitarian agencies are reporting a higher uh, level of, of family reunification, which is to be welcomed. But still, of course, it's worrying that Many children are still uh, in the situation of, of being unaccompanied or separated from their, their parents or caregivers, and there's a lack of durable solutions for those children, which leaves them very vulnerable to, to child trafficking. Um, and then finally, in, in, in terms of the, the, the key findings, um, if you look at the, the map here on the screen, you see that not only are there very high levels of, of Syrians displaced in, our, in the five countries under study, but they're also concentrated in, in particular areas. So uh, Turkey is now the, the country in the world with the highest absolute number of refugees with, with over 2.7 million Syrians. And the majority of these Syrians are concentrated in the southeastern provinces. So particularly Gaziantep, Shomurfa, uh, Hatay and Kilis. Um, in Syria itself, most of the displaced people, internally displaced people are in the north of the country. Lebanon then, uh, as a result of the Syrian crisis, has the highest per capita level of refugees of any country in the world. So a, a country with a smaller population and a, and a very high level of refugees. Um, in, the, in the north of the country, and particularly in, in Akkar and Bekka in, in Lebanon, uh, there are higher concentrations of Syrian refugees. The same applies to northern Jordan. And in Iraq, most of the refugees have settled in the Kurdistan region, the semi-autonomous region of northern Iraq. So this causes vulnerabilities not only for uh, the displaced people themselves, but also for host communities in terms of access to services, access to the labor market, and can, in certain cases, cause tensions between the communities. Although it's, it's good to note that, that these have been very isolated cases so far, but it's important to address these vulnerabilities, both of displaced people and host communities in these regions in, in order to avoid these uh, tensions becoming more severe. So finally then, and, and thank you very much for, for your patience and, and concentration in, in, in sticking with me through this. Um, the recommendations that, that we propose on the basis of these findings um, are, are more general. We, we also wanted uh, to 
discuss these with, with, with other stakeholders to really make sure that, that our recommendations uh, respond appropriately to our research findings. The recommendations that we make in terms of combating trafficking specifically is to address this form of low-level trafficking um, that, that I have explained to you. Also to focus on really proactively identifying the trafficking of refugees and providing protection to refugees who are trafficked. Uh, we also recommend addressing these forms of trafficking directly related to the war, so exploitation and armed conflict, forced marriage, sexual slavery, and to make sure to cover internal trafficking in anti-trafficking policy and initiatives, so to not always focus on cross-border trafficking. When it comes to reducing the general vulnerability of people in this context, uh, we recommend specifically providing access to regular employment, uh, and regularization of legal status. As, as I mentioned, it's very welcome that, that uh, these recommendations have already, to a certain extent, been acted upon. Uh, this needs to be combined with investment in the host countries, that the host countries really are overwhelmed at this point, so um, it's, it's not viable to, to have access to regular employment and regularization of legal status unless there is investment in, in the host countries and uh, legal channels for, for settlement outside the region. It's also important to guarantee sufficient funding and fair distribution of aid, particularly within Syria, but also in the host countries right now. There continues to be a shortfall in funding. Um, what the Special Rapporteur mentioned, which, which I, I hadn't mentioned yet, is, is that the majority of all displaced people in this context are not living in camps. So uh, within Syria itself, uh, it's less than 15% of internally displaced people in official camps. In Iraq, it's just over a third, uh, but in Turkey at this point, I think it's less than 10% uh, of, of Syrians are in official camps, uh, and in Jordan, it's around 17%. So if we focus our aid and other services only on official camps, it'll be difficult to access all of those refugees living among host communities. In Lebanon, of course, there are no official camps at all, so uh, all of the, the Syrians in Lebanon are living among host communities. Uh, and finally, in terms of general vulnerabilities, uh, we need to also address the vulnerabilities of host communities if we're going to have any kind of a, a, an effective and sustainable solution. The final set of recommendations then refers to specific groups who are particularly vulnerable in, in this context and specifically vulnerable to, to certain forms of trafficking. So for women and girls, it's essential to continue to combat gender-based discrimination and reduce the risk of sexual and gender-based violence. For children, it's absolutely essential to ensure that we have procedures and policies in place to ensure birth registration and access to schooling as basic child rights, as well as uh, in order to reduce the risk of trafficking. Um, Syrian citizens are not the only people who have been displaced by the conflict and by the violence. So for Iraqi refugees who were in Syria when the war broke out, for migrant workers who, who were in Syria, for stateless Syrians who are Kurdish or Palestinian refugees, it's important to have uh, specific measures in place to make sure that our response doesn't only cater to people who are Syrian citizens. And finally then, uh, of course, for refugees and internally displaced people who don't see a possibility to remain in the region, we need to significantly expand legal channels for settlements to avoid uh, these irregular migration routes, leaving people at, at risk of various violations, including trafficking. Um, this is also essential to ease the burden on uh, the hosting countries, which right now are, are, are hosting, as I mentioned, 85% uh, of all Syrian refugees abroad. So finally, of course, uh, I would recommend that you also uh, look at the, the, the full study. Um, the study is, is called Targeting Vulnerabilities because we found that traffickers in a very cruel way target people's vulnerabilities to profit or benefit from abusing their rights. But as policymakers and practitioners, uh, we must target vulnerabilities in a positive way. And this is where we and also all of you participants come in we need to uh, identify these vulnerabilities and alleviate them to prevent trafficking, exploitation and other abuses and uh, to increase people's resilience and provide alternatives to, to trafficking situations. So uh, we're now, as I mentioned, in the, in the final phase of our project. We are communicating, discussing our findings, discussing and adapting the recommendations at uh, 
regional and country level. We've been having a series of workshops in the countries under study. You can see here uh, one workshop we held in Beirut at the beginning of April. Um, we then want to move quickly along to implementing the recommendations. And this is also, of course, where all of you participants come in. We don't recommend conducting further research on this topic because we think it's urgent to now respond to the findings. However, in other regions, particularly the Western Balkans and, and the European Union, we think it would be important to replicate our methodology for, for other transit and destination countries because we're lacking data on the situation there in those countries at, at the moment. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much for, for your patience. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm very looking, much looking forward to your comments and your questions. Claire, thank you very much for this uh, very detailed presentation. We have been working together on this project. I have heard you presenting several times already the study, but every time I find it so interesting and you also managed to really like uh, captivate the attention of the of the audience so uh, it was so informative uh, while you were speaking uh, the chat got uh, quite active um, so i seen that some uh, via the chat some uh, participants wanted to to ask a question so first of all i would like to ask uh, natalie ruloda i saw that you raised the hand um at the very beginning uh, during the presentation of, uh, at the end of, sorry, of the presentation of the UN Special Rapporteur, but there was no possibility for me to give you the floor. So I wanted to ask you if you would like to raise your question now, please um, raise the hand and uh, I will be giving the floor to you. Uh, but I seen that uh, Violeria, Violeria Rosu and also Amala, uh, Obikoye and Navloren again, Apologies for my pronunciation. Have uh, raised the hand. So, um, Yorelia, you have the floor. Kindly, shortly introduce yourself and uh, try to be concise since the time is running. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, my, my name yes we hear you. We hear you quite far away. Maybe if you could try just to. Um, raise a bit the volume of your mic, if that's possible, or just speak very loud, please. No? Yes. yes, perfect, thank you. Yeah, my name is Viore Rianusui, I'm a gender anti-trafficking officer at the OT office in uh, Tajikistan. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, ICMPD for uh, approaching this issue, this uh, very uh, quite difficult issue on exploring the link between uh, between uh, human trafficking and rec recruiting people for um, joining the fighters in uh, in ISIS. Uh, it's also a quite sensitive issue. So uh, thank you, Claire, for uh, uh, explaining the vulnerabilities and the situation with people who are um, on the move and who. Uh, may be uh, in risky situation to become victims. Um, indeed, these two phenomena that I mentioned, they are different, but still we can uh, see the connections and nexus. And since we, these phenomena are hidden phenomena, it's very difficult to, to study the, the connection. But one of the links that we uh, definitely can uh, observe is um, uh, the link uh, that um, um, uh, indirect link, let's say, of uh, the people who are directly involved, uh, uh, being involved in these uh, terroristic activities. For example, the wives and children of uh, uh, fighters who join them, uh, traveling to uh, Syria, and then the, their husbands are killed. They became um, victims of uh, exploitation. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, the cases that we know, that we get to know, the depth of the um, top of the iceberg, yes? And uh, I can uh, share with you quickly several examples from uh, uh, Tajikistan uh, here that we observed from uh, mass 
media sources. Uh, it's several cases. First of all, uh, about 1,000 uh, citizens of Tajikistan have been officially declared that they join the um, uh, fight in, uh, in Syria. Uh, most of them bring their wives and children. Uh, so, um, several cases uh, that have been officially reported, uh, for example, uh, 12 Tajik women who have, uh, have escaped uh, by misery from, from the exploitation, and uh, uh, one woman uh, told that uh, her husband took her uh, promising uh, traveling as a tourist in Turkey, but they finally uh, go to Syria, and then uh, her husband died. Uh, her passport had been taken away and destroyed, and she was forced uh, to uh, a marriage with another man, uh, with another man in, uh, in Syria. Uh, also, there are cases reported in the mass media when uh, uh, Tajik women uh, they um, find um, they meet men through internet, through social networks, and they are proud that they are. Uh, invited uh, to marry them and uh, uh, to travel to Turkey, and then uh, they are brought to uh, Syria. Um, there are also cases uh, when Tajik citizens, young men, um, just 18 years old, they travel to Russia and they became vulnerable. Uh, they lose their jobs and uh, special uh, groups, uh, terrorist groups, uh, recruiters, they, they uh, promise them um, a job as fighters, but actually they exploit it in, uh, in, in the war in, in Syria. Um, the analysis of my colleagues from uh, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Uzbekistan and also Central Asia, they also report uh, in the media cases when um, uh, the women are proudly uh, recruited and they used as uh, sexual slaves uh, in, uh, in uh, Syria and also used uh, as uh, uh, bombs uh, in, in these countries. Uh, in Uzbekistan, women uh, um, reported, uh, they testified that um, there are many Uzbek women who agreed uh, to serve uh, as uh, intimate jihad in, uh, in Syria. Uh, so uh, all of them uh, have been recruited through internet and uh, um, they have been forced uh, to marry uh, uh, the fighters in, in Syria. Well, uh, as you see, there are um, cases, uh, uh, there are really, really not so many cases, and uh, that is why it's important to conduct this uh, studies, research, and to document, I guess, from all of the countries uh, who identify these cases, um, uh, trafficking cases, people exploited in, uh, in Syria, uh, in order to see the uh, connections and uh, to uh, learn better the way how people how people are actually recruited for this, uh, because if we... Yorelia, uh, I, uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting you, but we don't have much time left, and uh, I see that there are also other participants that would like to raise their um, raise questions, so um, I would uh, like to ask you to please share what you just said about uh, different countries in Central Asia, if you have any report or information to be shared, maybe via link, via the chat, that would be extremely beneficial. And uh, I would just like to give the floor to Claire if she just would like to um, comment uh, or react to what you have just said now. And uh, again, apologies for, for interrupting you, but time is running. Yes, we understand. Just to thank you again for continuous work on uh, researching the links. Thank you, Claire, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Fiorelia, and, and for your uh, excellent feedback and, and uh, very interesting comments. I think that uh, it's a central question that uh, we are all finally paying attention to the extent to which uh, terrorist activities may involve some form of trafficking or exploitation, even as its most extreme form when, when it manifests itself as, as you know, a suicide bombing. Um, Central Asia, of course, is a very important source region for uh, foreign fighters joining Islamist groups. 
in Syria and Iraq, uh, I think together with Saudi Arabia and Jordan, some of the most important uh, origin countries are, are in Central Asia. And so it's very important to understand to what extent any of this activity, both for uh, the young men and for, for women and children, is voluntarily or, or is actually a form of exploitation. One maybe relevant case that we found in the research from with, within Syria was one particular town that was under siege by the regime. And the town itself was controlled by an Islamist group, uh, Jaish al-Islam, and uh, people had no access to any means of survival. And so in order for families to survive, some boys and young men were joining this Islamist group, not because they believed in it, not because they wanted to fight, but because it was the only way to get any food or any money for their families. So uh, these kind of cases, I think we need to understand them a lot better. So thank you very much for, for raising that. Uh, I'll, I'll Give it back to, to whoever wants to ask the, the next question. Thanks again, Virelia. Yeah, thank you, Claire, and thank you again, Virelia. Uh, I saw Amala uh, raise, her, raise her hand. Please, Amala, the floor is yours. Just enable your mic, please. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Perfectly. Yes, Amala, we hear you very well. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Claire, for your presentation. It was um, captivating, as Elisa said. And uh, well done on getting the report published and all the best in the next steps. I have um, first a comment just in line with what the last speaker talked about um, being people who. Um, uh, being exploited because of their situation, like in Nigeria, for instance, you you see we've read, we know we don't have had data, but we've read in the newspapers and we watch on TV about people joining these the Boko Haram insurgents because um, they don't have a job or they're poor. So what the best other option is to join? And we also read reports of fathers selling their young children, especially female children, to Boko Haram insurgents, and they are eventually used as um, suicide bombers or married off to insurgents. So it, these are some of the situations, the, um, things happening because of the um, crisis, people being exploited because of their vulnerabilities. So let me quickly go to my questions because I know we don't have um, a lot of time. Specifically on the um, report, I was a bit. I wanted to understand a little about the baseline period because I know initially, I my initial understanding was that the report, the baseline period is 2011 to 2015. Then in between, I saw um, that the baseline of 2001 to 2010. So it was a bit confusing. Which what is the specific baseline period? Is it 2011 to 2015 or 2001 to 2010? Because, and in addition, when on the slide that talked about the baseline of 2001 to 2010, you talked about countries of origin of people trafficked. So are they countries of origin people trafficked to Syria or what was the destination? It wasn't very clear to me. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you, Amal. I would give the floor to Claire because definitely she's the most appropriate person to Give you an okay. Can I have? I have two more questions. Can I quickly ask them? Yes. Very, because the time is running. Okay. Then very quickly, the next um, question is: We mentioned that some countries like Lebanon, Lebanon, asked UNHCR to stop taking the, the data. In that case, on which basis would they use for policy making um, uh, um, for allocating aid if, if there is no data on refugees coming in? Then the last question is: um, You talked about the fact that Turkey has no refugee, um, did not ratify the Convention on Refugee Status. In that case, what is the status of the um, Syrians? As you said, they have the highest number of Syrians. And with the Europe, the deal with Europe now, a lot more of these of um, migrants or refugees coming into Europe will be sent back to Turkey. So what is going to be their status? I don't know how is it going to work. Then finally, one last question. Sorry, quickly. You talked about sexual exploitation through forced marriage. At which point is it termed 
um, sexual exploitation? Is it if is, there's a divorce after a number of years? But what if the marriage continues and they live on? At which point, well, how do you define it as an exploitation because it was first marriage? Because staying in Nigeria, a lot of people marry before the age of 18. Some of them live on with their husbands and have grandchildren. Some people get divorced early. Uh, what is the... Um, Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> I have to give the floor to Claire because actually these are four, four questions and she would need some time also to get back to you. So Claire, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jamala. Uh, really interesting questions and let me try to, to get through them. Um, indeed, the, the, the situation of uh, you know fathers in a very desperate situation uh, selling their, their daughters into forced marriage or uh, people being involved in terrorism and, and suicide bombings, um, there are many parallels between the situation in, in Syria uh, and the hosting countries and the situation uh, in, in Nigeria, Niger, Chad and Cameroon with the Boko Haram insurgency. Um, so I think there's a lot of lessons there. Of course, you hear stories all the time from uh, Western Central Africa of, of very young girls being involved in suicide bombings, where, of course, uh, that could be an indicator of, is most probably an indicator of, of trafficking. Um, in relation just to your question on the baseline versus the impact, the baseline period for us was the period before the war because that was uh, the, the situation against which we were comparing what has happened since. So 2001 to 2000 and to the end of 2010 was uh, the baseline period so that we knew what we were comparing when we started to look at the effects of the war since 2011. So just to clarify that. Um, the, the countries of origin that I mentioned for, for trafficking victims during that period, uh, those were the countries of origin of victims in all five countries under study. So throughout our study, as you'll see, uh, we cover the, all five countries. So, that, so that's what it refers to. Um, and then the, the, the last two questions, I think, particularly interesting. So Lebanon is in a, a very particular situation. Before the Syrian conflict happened, uh, Syrians had free movement, had free access to Lebanon. They were allowed to migrate there, work there. Um, Lebanon was already host to uh, a high uh, population of Palestinian refugees who were in uh, 11 camps throughout Lebanon, was also recovering from uh, you know, the, the, the impact of, of the civil war. And so uh, it places Lebanon in a very difficult situation to have this high number of of Syrian refugees. Uh, they feel completely overwhelmed. It doesn't seem possible uh, to have so many. And so uh, they have stopped registering any more people. Um, I think this is something that needs to be a shared responsibility uh, for all, for the international community, for, for all safe countries, is to, to recognize that that's an extremely difficult situation and to work on improving the situation of Syrians in Lebanon and uh, those uh, who will need to be resettled outside of Lebanon. That's the situation there. In Turkey, the situation is slightly different. Um, Turkey set up a special program specifically for those fleeing the, the Syrian war. Uh, it applies to everybody fleeing Syria, not just Syrian citizens. Uh, it's referred to as temporary protection. Under temporary protection, um, Syrians and others have certain rights, children have rights to education, they have uh, certain subsistence rights and so on. Uh, as I mentioned, the minority of them are living in, in official camps. The good news then is that since uh, January, they've been entitled to also apply for a work permit. We need to see now if the implementation of the work permit uh, goes well, um, but that should improve the situation. Um, I don't feel knowledgeable enough to comment on what the implications will be for uh, the EU-Turkey agreement. I know there's a very low level of implementation. It's not really working at the moment. Uh, it's not really being applied, but uh, the temporary protection Procedures in Turkey, it's important to note, only apply to those fleeing the Syrian conflict. So for any uh, Afghanistanis, Eritreans, Somalians who might be sent from Europe, returned from Europe to Turkey, they would not fall under these temporary protection regulations and they wouldn't fall under UN Convention refugee status in Turkey because that only applies to European citizens. Uh, so I'll, oh sorry, also what you mentioned about sexual exploitation by means of forced marriage. Uh, trafficking for forced marriage, we refer to as a situation when somebody is exploiting, usually a, a girl or a woman, uh, making money from their marriage. When a forced or temporary marriage is used uh, as a means of sexual exploitation, and so the profit is really being made from sexual exploitation, that's where we say it's trafficking for sexual exploitation 
by means of forced marriage. Um, as you'll see in the study, not all early marriages or not all child marriages are, are actually forced marriages or trafficking for forced marriages. So you have to be very specific in relation to, to what you're talking about. And we found various situations, situations of child marriage, situations of trafficking for forced marriage and situations for of uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation by means of forced marriage, very often using these uh, temporary forms of marriage in certain uh, Sunni and Shia Muslim communities, Ms. Sharon and Muta, abusing these forms of, of temporary marriage in order to exploit or abuse people. Claire, thank you very much for uh, answering uh, to the questions of Amala in such a concise manner. Um, we started a little bit late, so I would still like to ask to the remaining participants, if you would like still to ask one question to Claire, please raise your hand now, otherwise we will have to um, just move towards the, let's say, the final part of this webinar. I see that uh, Annie, via chat, um, ask a question. So Claire, if you have um, uh, access to the chat, maybe could you get back to her question? Um, Claire? Sorry, I was actually just uh, checking exactly where that was. Yes, um, in, in fact, in, in each of the... Hello? I think there is a technical... Mark, Mark, Mark. I think there is a technical problem because uh, I think we lost Claire. Um, Claire, could you just uh, try to reconnect in case... Uh, Hi, I'm there? back. Sorry. I, yeah, I lost my connection completely. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Good. Yeah, please go ahead. Out, but I'm back. Yeah, uh, I, I was just actually checking the, the precise part of the study where it is. But, but in Chapter 5, when we go through the different forms of trafficking where we, we encountered indications, in the research, uh, for, for each form of we all, trafficking, we also explain exactly what we mean. So uh, for us, for example, child labor or early marriage, these are forms of uh, child protection issues, the child protection concerns and violations, and we cover them under vulnerabilities. When it comes to trafficking, we look at actual trafficking for forced marriage or child trafficking for labor exploitation or worst forms of child labor. So you will indeed find uh, the specific definitions in chapter five of these different forms of trafficking. Also in the very first chapter of the study, you'll see our working definitions as well. 